Saturday night, it was like midnight, I was watching Minneapolis, the police station, on fire. And I was on Twitter. And this guy tweeted something, or he liked or retweeted, or we, we ended up having a Twitter exchange. And I went into his bio, and I said, he worked at Life Magazine. And I ended up reaching out to him because I was like, this guy was in media for a long time at one of the magazines that many of us grew up with, right? It was the staple, the standard bearer of, like, good journalism, good stories. You knew it was going to be comprehensive. You were going to learn something. And I wanted to pick his brain. And he responded. We ended up staying on the phone for a while, and he's got this amazing book, which I think is really important, What We Keep. 150 people share one object, and I want to talk to him about this. Let me welcome to the show former editor-in-chief of Life Magazine, Mr. Bill Shapiro. Welcome. I am so glad to be here, Karen. Thank you. Hi, Sheena. Thank you. Hey, it's Sheena's got his dog, which is making me smile, too. Okay, so, yeah, what's his name? Hello. What's his name? Rumi. Rumi's part of the show today. All right. Um, first, of all, first of all, before we get into your book, um, working at Life Magazine, which, again, as I mentioned, could we have a Life-type magazine today? Because I I haven't seen it. And what do you think is going to happen with media? Because I blame a lot of where we are as a nation on the devolvement of media. Well, I think it's going to be very difficult to have a large general interest magazine um, or media property that brings fragmented America together. You know, that's something that Life Magazine did. Life Magazine's heyday was actually before TV was able to communicate so quickly and bring the news to people overnight. So life, pictures in life were really everybody's major source for visual news. That's gone. It's fragmented. And I don't think, honestly, I don't think anybody knows what's going to come next. And if they did, we'd already be seeing some signs of it. You know, I, I have some hopes and prayers about what what could happen, but no no inside scoop for you. All right. What what are your hopes and prayers? Because I think we can manifest some things when we put it out into the universe. And what what are your hopes and prayers? Well, one thing is, you know, what 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 we have now that we didn't have back in the time of life's heyday, or even really twenty years ago, is we have camera phones which makes, which democratizes news gathering. And so if we take a look at what Darnell Frazier, um, Darnella Frazier captured with the George Floyd video, for example, incredibly powerful. And, you know, I don't have any statistics on this, but my, my guess is that in the first 48 or 72 hours, more people saw that than the Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination you know, that, that Life magazine made famous. So the potential is amazing. But what I think media, mainstream media needs to do is provide context for video clips like that and verification. Because people need to understand that this is, this actually happened, that, uh, and it was not doctored, you know, photoshopped or deep faked, but also what the context was, you know, what happened before incident X or, or after incident X, because sometimes 22 seconds of tape isn't enough. Bill, I think that I I love that you brought up deep fake. Uh, One of the things that I've thought about a lot is that the media industry can't actually verify anything. So how do you actually, does this seem like a organization? Is it a government entity that is then the truth, uh, the truth agency, uh, <laughs> no. or is it a independent consortium of private companies that have to form some sort of nonprofit? What is it? Was there a clearinghouse? How do you how do you battle something like deepfake if you want to give context and verify uh, news gathering that's been democratized? Yeah, I mean, I think we have the Trump administration just name a czar of the deepfakes, and they'll be responsible for fake news. No, um, that was a joke. <laughs> Great idea. Um, um, I think ultimately it will probably be a private company. I mean, I love your idea of an independent group of of experts coming together. But personally, you know, I think there's a huge amount of money to be made in verification. And so where the money is, is where the businesses will go. And so 
I think that some company, you know, it could be a, 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 um, an offshoot of a company that exists already, you know, take something like uh, Getty Images, you know, where I did used to work. So no conflict of interest there, but or or a news agency that starts a separate branch of verification. Um, you know, I think that's that's a possibility. We need that. Mm. I think truth is uh, there's no one that we can trust anymore. You know, I sit here, I do a talk show. Uh, I think people trust me, but I'm not a journalist on these airwaves. I'm a talk show host who, you know, is committed to truth because of my journalistic background, but I don't have to be, you know, and, you know, this right. is this is this is the problem. You know, we are putting our trust in news outlets that are really entertainment vehicles. You know, cable news is an entertainment vehicle. It's not a news outlet. Or or it's an outrage vehicle. You know, like if mm. you look at some of the folks on, on Fox News who are saying, you know, there was no evidence that masks work, you know, as recently as, as I think two days ago. Um, all the science is that masks work. So they are journalists, but there is no truth there. Well, I don't uh, think they're journalists. Bill, do you think do you think the funding sources have changed since when Life magazine was big and popular to today? And is that do you think maybe an issue of how we've gotten into the media landscape that we're in now? Well, so there's a couple things, um, and you know, one is, you know, Life magazine, you know, was a magazine for a huge swath of, frankly, mostly white middle class and upper middle class America. Not everybody, um, but, but you know, a big part of America. Today, media is fragmented. Um, if you like death metal music, there is a publication for you. If you like classical music, um, there's a publication for you. And so everything is fragmented and the advertisements go with that. That's number one. Um, number two is People have been trained not to pay for their information or their or their um, or their or their reading. And so, you know, if you click on a story that you like, if you through Twitter or whatever, and it says, "Oh, you have to subscribe," people are like, "Nah, I'll find another way to get that," and they often can or some version of it. So that whole income stream for many publications um, uh, has been cut out, you know, entirely. Mm. And now, we'll sorry, one Bill. more thing. Now, now that the events business is temporarily out of business due to due to COVID, that was a huge income for revenue stream for media businesses, which has just vaporized. 